in the I had to go get my daughter from uh the thank you for your patience by the way from the elementary school and uh, it's in San Antonio and it's kind of far away I'm out of the zone but because I'm divorced now and their dad still lives in our old house in the neighborhood where that school is and so we share them 50 50 and they um anyway point is is it's kind of far so I went to go get her and I went to go get her and uh her older sister who's just in the year above her so second grade and first grade the first grader was the one that was sick um I go this morning we looked at the paper for Red Ribbon Week and it said like something in your character day and I remember reading an email about a book character and I'm like oh I guess it's your book character day and my daughter was like yes it is and so we did Frida she I did it she did it she's there well when I went to go pick up my younger one uh and I was waiting for her there was like movement like some kids were going to school and I noticed like no one is dressed as a character like no one is here as a book character and so when she came out I said Chicky uh I didn't I didn't see anybody dressing up like nobody nobody dressed up she's like mom it's on Monday and I'm like, oh my God, no. So my second grader, I haven't talked to her yet, but she was the only one dressed up as a, as not herself today, but she looked so incredibly cute, like super cute. She had like flowers in her hair and we tied ribbons in and she looks adorable, but she is the only one dressed as that. So it's been a crazy day. Um, were these the cheeks you were talking about? So you come here to the PDF version, you can print it out, but you'll need a portion of the elementary and a portion of the middle school. So for the elementary, you would begin at, although it's useful to read, uh, in my opinion, as far as you being fully prepared to be the type of teacher that your students need to know what comes before and where are they expected to go after. Um, that's what vertical alignment is all about. And so kindergarten, um, you know, obviously they're not looking at atoms and discussing it, but they're beginning to talk about scientific things. And so each level uh, builds on each other. And so you see kindergarten through fifth grade science contact is organized in recurring strands. To be honest with you, they are all organized by recurring strands. And we can see those strands and identify them pretty easily here. Um, you know, we have um, my first graders over there watching Bob's Burger. I can hear it in the background. Um, that what? I thought that was an adult swim. I don't even watch that. No way. Uh, actually, I it might be an adult show, but like all of my children, even the old, because I have a nineteen year old, a seventeen year old, a um, fourteen year old, mm -hmm. an eight year old, and a soon to be seven year old. She's six right now, but she'll be seven in December. Um we've watched it since the beginning and I, I guess like, it's just been a thing, but like people have told me like, Oh, that's an, and I'm like, Oh my God, my entire family watches it. Like the kids know lines from it and it's not really anything inappropriate. It's just a family. And like one of the girls is a teenager and she's kind of boy crazy, but it's nothing like there's no sex, no anything involved. It's just uh innuendo and really funny stuff. So anyway, that's what she's over there watching. She's Probably six, like seven Simpsons and that's, yeah, I that's her favorite. The Simpsons, but I think it's like considered like an adult show too, but yeah. I grew up off of the Simpsons. So yeah. You see, and that's, and it's the same thing, but like, in my opinion, Bob's Burgers is so much better and it's less like raunchy than the Simpsons, any, but that's just my opinion. But yes, I grew up with the Simpsons as well. So physical science, you have one here, life science, earth and space science, you have unifying concepts, processes common to all species, you have tools, materials, equipment, inquiry, um, and, and this is your part, um, the instruction portion of it, um, history and nature. And so 
you have to, this document is a legal and binding sort of document. When you pass your exam, it's signifying that you know how to do these things. Um, you can't be a teacher without it by law. And so um, the exam maker only gets this document and the TEKS when they're going to create your exam. That's it. Those are the only two documents. They're not, a, there's not a textbook that they, the state sends them. It is your standards document and the corresponding TEKS. Now they, they're sort of overlapping, but the TEKS are going to be more in depth because the standards are for you. And so it's sort of like overarching concepts that you have to know. And then they get real specific as far as the TEKS are concerned. Um, but you don't need to just know these facts, scientific facts, processes, um, you know, safety rules and experimentation, um, and the skills that go with doing experimentation, data collection, safely utilizing things, all of that stuff. You also need to, you, and you need to know and be able to do those things so that you can model it for your students, but you also need to be able to um, redirect, correct, you know, evaluate and give feedback. Um, and so that requires A, you knowing everything that they have to know, B, you being able to do everything that they need to be able to do. So mm -hmm. with four through eight, and that's why really careful uh, readings, uh, very deep dive. And I say a deep dive because you go and you, you dig further via research, right? So you might see a word and it's like black hole. And I know what black holes are, but... I wouldn't be able to teach a class on it. Nothing that I would find like that I'd be able to measure their knowledge afterwards in order to do, I mean, could I? Absolutely, in 2.5 seconds. I would just need a little bit of time to research black holes, become proficient in it. It's not gonna take me super long to do that. Um, and, and then they're not things that I need to have memorized. I don't need to have like, you know, all of the, the specifics about black holes, but I need to know uh, what the students need to know at the very least and be able to apply the skills regarding that concept in a science setting. So our standards and the students teach, they parallel, they overlap, they correspond um, because they must. This is what the student, the state has decided that the student has to learn. And so that, um, you know, just via logic, we need to know it and be able to um, give feedback and instruct. So we have these recurring strands and concepts within each grade level, and they build on prior knowledge. That's what vertical alignment is all about. Kinder, first, second, third, and all of that good stuff. Um, the concepts within each grade level build on prior knowledge, prepare students for the next level, and establish a foundation in science. In kindergarten, the following concepts will be addressed in each strand. So these concepts must be included in each of the strands in their teaks at the kindergarten level. So uh, I know you're not kindergarten, but I just want for you to see how nuanced the instruction is. And it's carefully thought out by scholars and scientists and politicians as well um, to put this into law to say that this is the best instruction for in order for students to achieve that overarching goal. And there's an overarching goal for all, you know, science instruction, K through 12. We want our students to leave our classrooms and be able to do a particular thing in, in their, their lives scientifically to understand that science is everywhere. It's sort of ubiquitous, uh, very difficult to pull apart. It's so many, it's part of so many different professions overlapping with mathematics, um, art and engineering. You know, the architecture, it's a lot of science in it. Like it's just engineering is science. And so sort of allowing them to see that a lot of the jobs, the tasks, the buildings that they go to were all created by many scientists in a way. People who studied science know about it and know to apply it in the real world. Um, one of our one of our tasks for all education is to get the students to see how important their instruction is um, and that it has a place outside not just in college, but it just in real life.
Um, let me see. So this is these are things that they have to have um, in kindergarten, these concepts. And I'm not going to read them because you're not doing kindergarten, but um, these are the different areas though. You see a scientific. So each of these needs to be included in each of these areas. So you need a uh, scientific and engineering practices like the inquiry and questioning and all that stuff that was on your um you know four through eight the role of scientific inquiry in science and exploration um matter and its properties force motion and energy and that's physical science right that's the physical science portion of it earth and space science i believe there was a specific one for earth and space science somewhere where is it at Second to the bottom. All oh, right, second to the bottom. Um, Earth and space science. Here you have physical science, you have life science, how science affects daily lives of students and how science interacts with and influences personal and societal decisions. Like I'm from the Valley <clears throat> originally, but I live in San Antonio and every day in San Antonio, almost every day, I get a notification on my phone from my like my weather app or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, your air quality is really bad. <laughs> like it is like spend less time outside. And you I never really, but but like that's a serious thing, you know. And for kids that have asthma and people that have, you know, like pulmonary disorders and diseases, where you live might have something to do with you know science wise like what is the air quality outside and my life expectancy where i live so you know sort of overlapping just random things in our lives that are normal um that are very specific scientific things where people you know keep record and data and all sorts of charts to represent and and monitor these things the people who are monitoring the air quality I mean, they're not famous, you know, Einstein scientists, but their work is important, you know, it's important work. And um, they were just regular high school students one day. Now they're keeping everybody's lungs safe by telling them when it's okay to go outside. I feel like we live in one of those, sh like that show where everything's like slowly getting bad outside and they have to stay indoors. It's like a Disney movie. Um, okay, so you'll see, again, scientific and engineering practices is one of those overarching ideals, uh, recurring concepts and themes are going to be uh, matter and its properties, force, motion, energy, um, but look at Earth. Uh, uh, Sorry, my dad's making faces at me through the window. <laughs> oh, no, no worries, no worries. So let's take a look at this um matter and its properties so this is more like matter chemistry type thing in <laughs> kindergarten you're not going to be talking about any of that stuff you're not going to be talking about atoms or you're going to be talking about different things like liquid versus solid shape texture color but because um you know physically and uh uh, physiologically, their cognitive development, their maturity level, their ability to abstract things they can't see is not developed yet. So we're going to start with the basics. You'll see again, force, motion, and energy is uh, very little. And that's kind of like physics, right? Physical science and physics, just a little bit, not too much into the actual, what we would deem science of it, but certainly laying the, the framework talk discussing uh magnets how they interact the push and the pull talking about friction appearance of ob uh, different objects and how they might fall more quickly than something else maybe not understanding the science and the gravitational pull and a mathematical equation that's used to like decide but um beginning to lay those frameworks so for this and for all of your teaks I would, um, if you haven't already done so, and I think you said you printed this and your standards out, but you want to do annotate your text. Like I want to see it. And I literally want you to send me samples of it where you have, um, here's third grade and we're moving to fourth now, where you have um, 
chunk, chunk the text. Yeah. So not just notes, but there's a, there is a strategy that we utilize in, um, what is this fourth grade that we utilize in ELAR. And I was an ELAR teacher for 16 years and I've been teaching, um, I've been teaching since 2003 and teaching teachers full-time uh, since 2014. <clears throat> but I started tutoring them in, in 2012. So I taught ELAR and um, one of the most important sort of reading, reading, uh, reading, uh, study, cognitive, metacognitive strategies is uh, annotating the text, like getting the students to dialogue with a new text. And so, especially if it's a particularly challenging uh, text or um, a text that is sort of has a lot of uh, concept suitcases, which means that there's like a, it might be one word, but it's a loaded word, meaning it carries a whole bunch of other stuff. Like if you were to empty a suitcase, that word is a suitcase of ideas or maybe strategies that they're talking about. And so you have to sort of unpack it mm -hmm. um, with, for those types of deep readings, those critical reading of, of typically expository text, which this is an expository, it's not a literature text. And, and a lot of times we will have to define words and there's no problem uh, or shame or, um, you know, any sort of issue ever for me or any other good teacher with having to look up a word, especially if you're doing a deep reading. For my students, when they were taking their, um, well, honestly, when they did anything, if they didn't understand a word, I wanted for them to use the dictionary. On the state exam, they are allowed to use the dictionary. So one of their skills is and must be dictionary skills for them. So I made sure they knew how to use it. How do we use the dictionary to look up words? So you know how to look up words because you will find words that you don't understand. And some of your normal decoding strategies won't have worked for you and you will have to look it up. Not looking it up when you have a dictionary is crazy pants to me, I would tell my students. And I taught seven through 12, I would say there's no reason you should ever get a vocabulary word wrong on the start because you can look it up. And I taught toss and tax and EOC and star. So um, same for this, right? especially with your teeks, because this is going to be your profession forever. You should really know the ins and out and the crevices of the teeks and understand what they want for you to do. So as you're reading these, chunking the text means that you are everywhere there's a, a break, or if you need to make your own break, you can, or if you need to chunk it in a different way, you can. It's up to you. These are your notes, but typically, and this is a strategy that you could use with your own students, so you would paraphrase this. And I am the worst I like I could, my annotations are beautiful on all of my own work, but I am the worst as far as digital writing. So like maybe paraphrasing or in your own words, if you can say it in a couple of words, what, what's in there. Um, likewise here, what is this mostly about? And if it needs more, like you need to, um, you know, define correlative um, because it's a type of investigation and these are types of investigations we should be trying out and doing with our students they have to have experience in these so um, a deep dive of your um, teaks is going to be you thoroughly reading paraphrasing and and paraphrasing is a good activity after every chunks test text because and you don't have to paraphrase the whole thing like summarize it restate it um, you know, this reminds me of this. Sometimes it'll be a question. Sometimes it'll be a drawing what your note is. It's not always the same thing. It is you engaging with the text to enrich it so that it's an easier read for you next time you read it because you will never have to not look at these again. Your teaks are what you use to create your lesson plans, right? So students, and we'll go to, and this is fourth grade, um, and this is part of their uh, scientific uh, and engineering practices underneath that strand, they have to, student asks, they must be able to ask questions, identify problems and plans, and safely conduct classroom, laboratory, and field investigations, which means you have to take them outside to do other ones. There are some science teachers that don't, like that literally don't go outside ever. Man, I try to do so many fun things and experiments if possible. And there are, you know, 
other campuses that are better suited to like outdoor exploration and out, but I mean, you, you have to be creative. Um, I have been to, there's this um, city in Texas, it's called Magnolia and it's, it's like North up central Texas. Um, and it's gorgeous. And the trees are crazy tall. Like you're not in our state at all. Like, and, the, and it's all, and some of it's swampy and some of it's, and so their elementary and their junior high were both nestled in this like fairy wonderland that I added like a, that I could never imagine myself. Children go to school there. And there was uh, swamp areas and a creek area nearby. And very often the science classes go and they collect specimen and they do stuff. They do tadpoles, they check the different stages, which is really cool and easy for them. And they don't have to spend any new money, but it's proximity for them. Um, if you were to be so lucky to be on a campus like that, or you get um, you know, a best case scenario on your exam because that's what you're getting on the best campus in Utopia ISD, which there are some Utopia ISDs here in Texas. But um, you would, instead of teaching them the life cycle of a tadpole, uh, you know, not have them view a video, you would have them go outside and collect a specimen, uh, the tadpoles in the creek or whatever. And then a follow-up question could be something like, you know, what would be the most appropriate first step for Miss Garza to take with her sixth grade science class before she goes to collect um, tadpole specimens in the field for the first time? They could give you all these different questions, but I'll guarantee you the best response is going to be that you go over safety procedures for the new environment. If it is your first time in a new environment, whether it be uh, a new classroom activity that they've never done before, a new laboratory activity, a new field investigation. You want to review safety procedures and or teach them, instruct them for the first time. And you'll have different ones for different environments, right? So if we're going to go to the creek outside behind the school. I might have to have a whole type of different safety and behavioral discussion, like a discussion with the students, not just dictate to them, you will do this and you will do that. That doesn't work with kids. They have to feel like they're part of the plan. Okay, we're going to go out there and collect tadpoles. What kind of behavior do we need to exhibit or should I expect from you guys so that we're safe, so that nobody gets dirty, so that parents don't get upset and we never get to go to the creek to collect things anymore? And so that the principal lets us come back, like what kind of things do we need to do that's sort of different from the classroom? Have that conversation with them so that they have to come up with it and they have to say, well, we can't push each other in the creek. Excellent, you can't push each other in the creek, no pushing. So everybody's there on the day you're discussing and you've already sort of, uh, they know what to expect. They know what is completely not expected of them and reasons why they need to behave in a certain way. Listen, several reasons. We could get hurt. People could get dirty. Their parents will get upset with them. I know how my mom was with me when she sent me with something she, you know, like if I wore like guest jeans and I got some stuff on it, you know, she spent a lot to buy me them because I begged for them and I got them dirty. It would be a problem. So many reasons why we should be mindful of our behavior. One, first and foremost, we're scientists and we should, you know, and so building up that, that culture in your classroom helps you, helps you get that buy-in from the kids. If in the beginning of your science instruction, you tell them, guys, we are scientists in here. And as such, we're going to have to be like responsible, sort of mature. I mean, even if you have fourth graders, they want to feel mature. And they, my daughter loves to feel like she's a scientist. And I tell, tell her she is all the time. And she really is. She does the coolest things. Um, my little brother too. We had a, a broken light. One of those really long light pictures, broken yeah. light. It didn't work for like the longest time. I don't know what he did. We left him alone. Like it was like months after it broke and he somehow fixed it. And he, he got like some random little switch from one of his toys and he connected it to it. And that's what turns it on now. It's, it's weird. It's crazy. You see, and they, the thing is, is that so many of the kids have that in there and a lot of it gets lost, that natural curiosity and that natural like ingenuity also, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, and um, Piaget told us students that learn 
best through experimentation, through, um, you know, problem solving, through seeing things being modeled, through experiencing the world. And science is the best class for them to really get to experience academics come to life. And I'm, I'm sad that like, you know, I remember in my elementary, but I went to an elementary and it was in Austin, like in Round Rock area. And so I remember in that school and it matters the different, you know, resources, but not on the test, but it just does in real life. But um, my science classes, we would um, heat up in the little, the beakers, different um, liquids, you know what I mean? Like we would uh, like try to dissolve salt or whatnot. We started talking about like the solutions and, but I don't think that my children did that here in this campus and their science rooms are not really made for experimentation like that at their campus. It's just their classroom and they just do science during a certain time period. There's not like a science room where they can do um, lab things. And I feel like every elementary should have at least one lab that the science classes should, can go to. And maybe they do, and I just don't know what I'm talking about, but I don't think so. Um, it, it's changed a little bit over time. Cause I mean, I'm 23, my little brother is 11. And the way he's learning is completely different from how I learned, even though he's going to the same school district I grew up in, but it's, it's very different. We were doing experiments in fifth grade. And I think the first time he saw an experiment was now that he's in sixth grade. And even yeah. that, I think he said it was like that elephant trunk thing where they mix things and it just like slowly like foams up and comes out of the beaker. Something oh, like I don't that. know. I haven't seen that. I've never but heard I want to say <laughs> for sure in seventh grade, we dissected oh no sixth grade we dissected a frog and in eighth grade we dissected a fetal pig we got fetal pigs oh, wow. at my junior high in Uvalde and oh, wow. yeah yeah my <laughs> little sister went to Rob Elementary and uh so it hit really close to home when when that shooting happened um mm -hmm. Um, but at, at that school, and the thing is, it was an old, it was an old school and it had cool, our science classroom at the junior high was so cool. My goodness. It was like a university, but it was like an old small town, the old junior high that used to be the high school, you know? And so it was like, our science room was like a high school science room, sort of, um, when we got to do really cool things. Um, but I, I don't see that. I mean, we need to bring that back. Hopefully if Bethel wins, we'll start funding because, you know, the Republicans have been in charge for the last eight years and education as someone who has taught since 2003, I have seen the decrease in funding. It is so ridiculously crazy. It just, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I'm just hoping for something better. I know that um, I spoke to Bethel, he was running for Congress, and even then he was telling me like how important education is and that the way to fix everything is to reinvest like crazy, crazy in our teachers and in our education systems. Um, but the Republicans don't want that, so they'll do anything not. So if you haven't already voted, please vote. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So I'm going to want to meet with you again next week. What I want for you to do is get started on your annotation, right? Start with fourth and fifth grade. Do a deep dive of those. And if you have to, like, um, like this is the page for fourth. I believe it starts up here. Fourth grade. Um, or you can just print it like straight. Um, they just added this PDF. They didn't used to have, they used to only have the web this available like since forever. Um, and here you can go and just get like, here's just fourth grade. You know what I'm saying? Um, and the other one is the whole shebang all together. Um, this is just fourth grade. So just do fourth and fifth grade deep dives. Um, what is the overarching goal of that science instruction? Um, you know, for, for those students, how does it differ from fourth and fifth? What additions? And then anything that you um, weren't, anything that you couldn't like just turn to your little brother and tell him about like Earth's renewable and non-renewable resources and just kind of like give a mini 
instruction session, then you need to Google. Uh, and you don't necessarily need to Google. You, I should have put a whole bunch of videos and, and you can find more of them in the science uh, seven through 12 playlist. And there's a lot of overlap. So you can look in this, watch these ones too, because I go over seventh and eighth grade teaks with these students because there's overlap, right? We have overlap in EC through six, there's fourth through sixth grade that is overlapped. And then we have um, seven and uh, eight for many levels and six through eight in many levels, depending on you know how the state broke it down. But here you have um, some of the... Wait, is this Those are cute videos. They are, and they're good. They're really good crash courses. I they come highly recommended from a student who failed his science uh, seven through twelve the first time, and then we met together, and he came during my office hours because I'm available via this link every um, Tuesday and Thursday from nine to eleven. So he would just pop in whenever he had time, like for a couple of weeks, Tuesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. And he also watched these crash course videos that gave him an like a solid overview where he would be able to, um, you know, do reasonably respond to a question on the exam. And he passed, uh, you know, with really uh, high marks. So take a look at some of these as well. And um the science four through eight. I'll add some more um, in there mm -hmm. for you. And then we'll add this one to the mix. So hopefully it can help somebody else. Um, but you might have to look up something that you, like I know, like not in fourth grade, but let's go to, go back. for So for the earth and space one. There's some earth and space words and content specific stuff that they need to know that I was like, oh, I have no idea what this is, but it's like higher up in eighth grade and they know more like they probably I went to high school. I graduated in the year 2000. So like they probably hadn't even learned many of those things about black holes that they now make the kids learn about just like in junior high. So they're definitely going to be smarter than us. And there, there's no shame in you not particularly knowing them. These were updated in uh, 2021. So they have been updated with new science to make our students knowledgeable for when they get out. So there, there will be things on there that you don't know, depending on when you graduated. Um, there was so some topics like um, in the when I, when I took the exam the first time, I took the exam and there were some questions there, I guess what you would more or less think would be the tougher questions. They were papitas, but then you get like these questions that they they talk about like frequencies and things like that. And it's like things that was covered. I remember like in physics, but it yeah. wasn't like, it wasn't like, this is what you need to know. Let's go in depth. Like the question was, and it was Absolutely. just, like, it was just a brief thing that they were like, oh, by the way, there's also this, but we don't really need that kind of thing. Yeah. But that on the exam and I was like, <laughs> so yeah because on your um and we'll go there right now actually just real quickly because the junior high levels what they're doing is they're preparing them exactly for the physics classes and so in uh not high school middle school so the, certainly a lot of um are these the ones that were adopted oh yeah so they've been, the science ones have actually been updated more than most. Like, I think the English language arts ones were updated in like 2014. The social studies ones were 2017. These were the most recently ones that I've seen, which is awesome. That means that, I mean, somebody's paying attention to the science and adding to it. Um, but here it is. Uh, Newton's second law of motion, right? Force, motion, energy. And so those are specific equations that you have to know to compute, um, you know, the force with which something, you know, and if something is like, there's a, and they have to know it too. So again, if they have to know it, we have to know it. So a quick Google 
uh, or YouTube search will bring up, um, you know, a, a really quick review for Newton's. You can even do Newton's law for seventh graders or Newton's law for eighth graders. And you'll see a teacher. Maybe they made that video during the coronavirus pandemic where they were trying to teach that particular thing. So there's a wealth of resources there. Go through just at the moment. Do, um, if you can, fourth and fifth. And if you want to throw in six before next week, and then um, you choose a date to sign up with me next week. And then I'm also going to add other science four through eight students that are taking this exam, um, you know, to just offer them to come to the session as well. And we'll do, um, we'll look at what you've done and we'll look, answer some questions and uh, look at some of the, uh, before you look at some of the other ones. So fourth through fifth grade, correct on the TEKS? Yes, that's correct. And then begin correlating in them. Those TEKS, you have to print them out, but you also have to correlate them with this because it's good. They're one of the TEKS is going to be about them practicing or using safe safety practices, right? You have to use, employ them. You have to design scenarios in which and plan scenarios which the students are able to be instructed on those same safety practices in the lab, in the field, during demonstrations, in the classroom, on a field trip, wherever the scenario dictates, you know, wherever the science experiment is going on. So um, correlating them and um you're you're going to be adding notes to it each of them pictures drawings um paraphrasing um and the reason you're doing this not because you don't know these things um you know put pictures of this different safety caution things there but you you should know the difference between the di like the different things the i walk station and whatever else um they, they will give you pictures. They will give you graphs. Um, they will can and will use anything from the teaks and can use anything, you know, from this side as well. Um, that's you doing and implementing everything that you already know as far as knowledge. The left-hand side is your knowledge standards. And the right hand side is sort of your skill as a in, in pedagogy. You're in planning, implementing, you know, that means you're carrying out what strategies are you using? Did you pre teach academic vocabulary so that your students are able to utilize the language necessary in the experiment and they're understanding what it's about, how it works? Um, and, and then your assessment, because instruction and assessment go hand in hand like for education they they are the yin and the yang and i bet you in the visual representation assessment would or the tests part of it would be the darker portion of it but it's not really this big meant to be so big and scary it's made that way because of the state and these big tests that we have to do but really assessment um is meant to inform our decision making as the instructional planner in the classroom for the particular students we have. They're going to be diverse with diverse needs and diverse strengths, whether they're English language learners, special ed, you know, um, they're 504, GT, they all have particular needs. They're, they're diverse humans. And so our planning should be representative of the students that we have and be cognizant of what, what their skill and grade level is so that we could provide, you know, the best, most engaging opportunities for them and um, opportunities that they would find interesting. If we do things that are uninteresting to them, um, and I'm not saying that we have to design everything to be interesting, but at times take their life, their, their things that are important to them, things in their community um, and try to tie that in to classroom discussions or demonstrations or, you know, field experiments. Um, if there's a de been a decrease in butterflies because of climate change, there's a lot of, if I were a, a 
science teacher, I would go outside and say, let's go outside. We're going to go outside for 20 minutes. I want for everybody, no, not a whole bunch of talking. I want you to count how many butterflies, you know, put a little stick or whatever, how many you, you identify. You see, everybody's going to sit in a spot and we're going to count how many we saw in a 20 minute period over a week. And then next year we, we can do it again. And then we can tra track and trend. Like Miss Elsa said, that's like something that's real in their life that they could go do and have fun. They would be counting. They would be like checking for differences. What's the average that everybody saw? Did some people miss? Why might some people miss? Well, you know, Francisco was talking to Jeffrey and that might be why they missed. They had less butterflies counted because they were talking and not looking for butterflies. So, you know, doing real science with them with real things and, and showing them that even like keeping track of something and telling is science. And that's really what we do with our assessment. It's science. Like teaching is literally, we're scientists. Teachers are scientists. We have a very unstable like material that we're supposed to produce into citizens that are happy and healthy and, and meet these expectations um, when they're coming from very different, uh, varied places. It's a science. We, we know what research says, what best practice is. And so utilizing the TEKS, implementing best practices, students can achieve success. So every teacher is legitimately one of those unsung scientists that doesn't get paid a lot, but does a whole bunch for society. So thank you for choosing teaching and sign up next week. And I will, um, I will invite other people to our session and um, hopefully you can get like a study group going together. When do you plan on taking your exam? Um, so I had taken like the first time because I, I wasn't sure how it was supposed to work. So I had just signed up. So it was yeah. like, I was ready, but not ready. If that made any right. sense. Yeah. You weren't as know. prepared in depth. So now you know what to expect and how to prepare. Yes. And then I, since I work in law enforcement, so I'm okay. on, I'm on the first shift. I'm on the morning shift, but it only lasts for three, for three months, beginning okay. of October. And I believe January is when we're changing. So I go to graveyard, which is going to be kind of, ugh. yeah. Um, so I don't, I feel like I would be a lot better prepared maybe by December, maybe okay. mid to early December. Okay. I, I don't want to wait like it's not like yeah I would say like um you know try to shoot for November that way if you pass it you could apply and get in because in January they hire so many teachers like people move they retire like so um yeah try to do that that way you have a little bit of wiggle room initially I was like if I like it because I think the test was September 26 is when I took it so I was mm -hmm. like I had read where I had to wait like 30 days so I was like November I'll beat this right like I'll have like I already know what it was like I'll be able to like you know yeah study better like be able to focus on the parts that were a little more complicated yeah absolutely but then so I was I <laughs> for November um, do I need to give them the go ahead to open it so you can um, like purchase it and schedule it? Perhaps, yes, because I, again, I only have during the week, I only have Fridays off. I'm My okay. schedule set up to where I have Friday, Saturday off and I okay. work the morning shifts. And I had noticed during the September timeframe, there wasn't any like testing, testing times. Yeah. They're like one o'clock or something. So I would really like to do it like on, like on a Friday morning. Okay, well, I will let them know in the office to open it for you. Let me know what date you end up choosing and then mm -hmm. um, set up a session with me next week so I can see how you're doing with your deep dive and maybe uh, answer any questions that you have. And then whenever you need to pop in or touch base with me between now, you'll know your study guide. Like you can focus and really revisit some of those things. Like maybe if your physics is, is not super strong, watch physics videos. And there is, and we'll do talk about this next time. There are um, like practice tests that you can use actually to, to help like bulk up on some of those science facts. They're on the TEA website. Mm -hmm. They're the star release tests for like the eighth grade, 
And I think there's even one, actually, you know what, let me just, I'm going to share my screen again. And we're just going to look really quickly before I let you go. Yeah, notice there was on the, on, when I took the test, there were some questions that were from the, the yellow, the study guide, the, what is it called? The metrics. Secret study guide, that one. There were some questions that actually came from there. And there were some questions from the, the website itself. There was like a little, like a teeny tiny, I think it was like 10 or 15. Oh, that's excellent. Hey, any little bit helps. And there so, was some from there. Yes, they don't do it anymore. They used to, uh, but you have it in fifth grade, which is good because that's one of yours. So you have, here are tests. These are things. So this is the, the answer key, but it gives you a really good um reason why it would be wrong the circuit will not light the bulb with this bulb with the switch uh when the switch is closed because the circuit is open there is no wire and that's what your brother knew how to do it fifth graders need, need to know how to do it that's crazy pants they're so much smarter than us okay so that's why he knows how to do that and we don't because we learned this like in high school or something, maybe if we had a good, you know, science teacher. So um, this would be a good review and there's several different years. So, so this is the way that it is. This is the actual exam here. So this is um, 2022 and here are, here's one of those um, examples. And so there, I would definitely print those out and just become familiar with what's right and what's not, you know what I mean? Like review these like over and over again, kind of like a memorization type game. Mm -hmm. um, but just to be competent with those concepts because those concepts are the ones directly from the teaks. Anything on this fifth grade exam is going to be in the fourth grade and fifth grade teaks. They should have learned it, which is why the state is assessing it. This is my little sickie here. Can you see her? Hi. So this is the one I go pick her up and I'm she's walking ah. towards me and the fourth and fifth graders are moving somewhere and I'm noticing that no one is dressed as something else. And she comes out and I'm like, mama, how come no one dressed up? And she kind of like looks to the side and is like, she starts <laughs> laughing and is like, it's not character day. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know what my daughter is going to say. She is going to have words for me. So we'll see what she says. It's I not today, they, they could wear their like costumes or something to school. My little brother didn't want to wear his. Yeah, well, it's on Monday that they get to do dress as like, you know, a historical or book character. And so she went as Frida and she looked adorable, but she's literally the only one on the entire campus dressed as something we'll see so also in the seventh grade you have science oh no not seventh grade in the eighth grade you have the science exam so take those two and that's going to have stuff from sixth grade seventh grade and eighth grade and some of the more challenging concepts are obviously going to be in those eighth in that eighth grade exam so um it's going to be it's going to give you those formulas you need. Remember, we were talking about the speed, the velocity with which something and net force, mass times acceleration. Here are those formulas. And so if they have to do it, we have to be able to do it. And that means it's going to be pre-chemistry as well. So it might be balancing equations or identifying like the molar mass of a particular chemical. So you have to know that stuff as well. Um, this is going to be useful. I, I will put this in your, your science folder. I'll download them and put mm -hmm. all of the fifth grade and, and eighth grade uh, star release tests in there for you and the others. That way you guys can, uh, you know, utilize them in your study sessions and whatnot. It is my hope that by inviting the other people, uh, you guys can get a little, uh, a study group together and virtually help each other like you do this year somebody's really strong with the math skills on physics or the chemistry um because some people have um studied in particular these these things so hopefully we can get some good study groups together for you guys hopefully i used to be really like my best subject was always physics i hated math but physics was always super easy and chemistry like yeah like i can get through it 
And then I took the exam and the easiest thing was the chemistry. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. out the window. I love physics. I love physics. But if you're, if you're rusty and the thing is, is that you're probably just rusty. If you loved it, your neurological pathway is like a pathway that just has a little bit of leaves and you need to go in there and like the side, sweep the sidewalk and then the path is perfect and you'll be able to re- go back and forth super quickly and retrieve that information. So you just need that, <laughs> that review. <laughs> is that- All right. So I will see you next week. I look forward to working with you again and getting you in the classroom. Cool. Thank okay, you. Next- Thank you for meeting me. Absolutely. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Likewise. Bye-bye.